Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Denise Hurd, the Vice President of Research for U.S. Poultry and Egg Association, and I would like to welcome you to our U.S. Poultry Funded Research Tech Talk session today. This session will feature a discussion on U.S. Poultry research priorities and how they get funded. We have six outstanding researchers, which will be providing highlights from completed funded research projects over the past year. This session will focus on poultry diseases, animal welfare, and food safety. I am very pleased to introduce our first presenter this morning, Mitsu Suimoto, Research Specialist from the College of Veterinary Medicine at North Carolina State University. Thank you. Good morning. Today I'd like to talk to you about using avirulent strains of Enarchococcus sicorum to competitively inhibit the pathogenic strains. And first I'd like to thank the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association for their support of this project and others in our lab. So to start, Enarchococcus sicorum was initially described as a streptococcus in 1983. They're gram-positive cocci and they grow cream to gray-colored mucoid colonies on blood agar. They're a normal gut commensal in poultry, and in fact, there are reports that they can become the most common gut commensal in chickens by five weeks. And that's really all we knew or thought about Enarchococcus sicorum until 2002, when there were multiple reports of broiler flocks with birds presenting with paralysis at four weeks of age. And these birds had this very common but strange posture where their legs are cranially extended. And at necropsy, they found pure found very distinct lesions in the free thoracic vertebra of these birds, and they grew pure cultures of Enarchococcus sicorum. So this disease, Enarchococcal spondylitis, was first described in Scotland and the Netherlands in 2002. Then, not until 2009 did it appear in the US when doctors Barnes and Aziz described cases in North Carolina. It had the misnomer kinky back early on because kinky back is actually a, a congenital deformity of the spine. It affects broilers and broiler breeders, and birds can present at two weeks of age with sepsis and pericarditis, and we're actually seeing more of that presentation now. But then at four weeks, the paralysis, paresis and paralysis begins to appear. And you can see in the sagittal section that how the lesion impinges on the spinal cord causing hemorrhage and paralysis. The mortality is variable. It can be from 2 to 15 percent, but their losses are actually greater because there's a lot of condemnation at processing. There's no effective antibiotic-free treatment, and to date, there's no preventative. So in the beginning, the question was, had something changed in the birds or had something changed with the bacteria? And to answer this, we first did a longitudinal field study, also funded by U.S. Poultry and Egg, and we followed affected and unaffected farms for six weeks, and we collected uh, gut, spine, and spleens from birds starting in week one, and cultured for Enarchococcus sicorum. And on the affected farms, we found that already in week one and two, we saw positive spleen cultures for Enarchococcus sicorum, and we could also get it out of the gut. And as you see, the spleen positive cultures increase over time. And by week three, we were beginning to see spinal, positive spinal lesions. But on the control farms, we couldn't culture Enarchococcus sicorum until week three and four, and we only ever found it in the gut. So the question was, what's different about these bacteria that we're seeing early on that first week? So to answer that question, we did a lot of pulse fields and compared the DNA fingerprints. And from the isolates from the birds with lesions were very similar to one another. In fact, they were almost clonal with a 90% similarity. The isolates from the uh, control birds were very different. These were bacteria collected only from the gut. So that was our, really our first evidence that there were pathogenic strains of Enarchococcus sicorum. For our next step, we did whole genome sequencing, first with only three spinal lesion strains, the SA1, 2, and 3, and three sequel strains, CE1, 2, or commensal strains, CE1, 2, and 3. And we found that there were genes that were conserved in the pathogenic strains and absent or very different in the commensal strains. And some of these are listed here in red, and many of them are part of the enterococcal cell wall or the capsule. 
So our next step, we also followed 22 distinct outbreaks in the U.S., mostly in the southeast, and followed with more pulse field gels and more sequencing. And we found those differences held true, those conserved genes. So let's go back to that time course of pathogenic enterococcus infection. We see that, again, week one, we have positive gut cultures and spleen, and then eventually we begin to see those positive spinal lesions. So this leads us to our disease model, that in the very first week, the birds are colonized in the gut with these pathogenic enterococcus secorum. Those bacteria can escape the gut, the birds become septic, giving you that pericarditis stage, and then we see the paralysis and spondylitis at three, starting at three weeks of age. So what about interventions? What would be possible interventions? Well, everybody automatically always says vaccine. Well, it would be great if we could have circulating antibodies to prevent the sepsis stage, but there are problems with that. First of all, immunity has to be present in the very first week and then continue for multiple weeks. So you can't just vaccinate the chicks and you can't just vaccinate the breeders. And we also know that antibodies produced in response to vaccine strains may not be protective. And that extensive capsule, some of those conserved genes and the pathogenic strains may allow the bacteria to evade phagocytosis. And in fact, we know that's true because we've done opsonophagocytosis assays. And you can see that the commensals are recognized in phagocytose by the macrophages. But these two pathogenic strains, even following opsonization, they're not recognized by the macrophages. There's no phagocytosis. So they basically, that capsule provides that perfect cloak of invisibility. So now that leads us to our hypothesis and rationale for our probiotic trial. What if we could competitively exclude those pathogenic strains before they're able to colonize the gut? So we would hope that that would decrease colonization, decrease sepsis, and decrease spondylitis. So we thought about what could we use as probiotics, and we know that lots of companies are working with bacillus and lactobacillus and other bacterial species. But we thought, well, Enterococcus secorum is already part of the normal gut flora, and maybe uh, strains of Enterococcus secorum could better outcompete the pathogenic strains. So our first, um, we first looked at commensal strain cocktail, and again, this is CE1, 2, and 3 that we had already characterized. We also thought that perhaps deletion mutants of a pathogenic strain would also be good competitors. So we made deletions in that capsule, and again, these are the genes that are conserved in that path those pathogenic strains. So we specifically targeted these CPSC and CPSO, which are genes in that capsule synthesis pathway. And we made deletions in our uh, wild type SA1. But before we could use those as a probiotic, we had to prove that they were attenuated, that it was safe to use those in these birds. So we first turned to our embryo lethality assay. This is a Kaplan Meier curve and with probability of survival on the y axis and time on the x axis. And we showed that CPSC and CPSO are attenuated. In blue is SA1, our wild type, with a 60% chance of survival. And the CPSC deletion has 100% survival, and the CPSO deletion has a 95% survival. So we felt pretty good about that. And next, we needed to test them in birds. So in our bird challenge model, at five weeks with the wild type, we had almost a 60% positive spleens with the wild type challenge, but with the CPSC challenge, there were no positive spleens. And the spinal cultures reflected the same, with 32% positive spines at five weeks with the wild type challenge and none with the CPSC challenge. And we now have similar results for our CPSO mutant too. We've never been able to culture that from the spleens or spines of birds. So, this leads us to our first ob probiotic objective, it was to test the efficacy of these avirulent commensal strains and the, and the deletion mutants to block this, uh, com competitively exclude the pathogenic strains from adhering to the gut. And we did this in our bird challenge model. 
So for the study design, at Hatch, we place 120 chicks per group with 20 chicks per pen. We orally gavage them with 10 to the 7th CFU of either the probiotic cocktail or the CPSC deletion, CPSO deletion, or PBS. Then on day five, we challenged with 10 to the 7th CFU of a pathogenic strain of Enterococcus secorum. On day 14, we collected spleens from four birds per pen to measure sepsis, and then on day 35, we cultured spleens and spines from the remaining birds. And what we found at two weeks, that there were no difference, significant difference among the um, spleen, positive spleen prevalence in, among the groups. There was a tendency, a trend from 75 to 55% decrease in the birds that had received the commensal strain as their probiotic. However, at five weeks, there was no difference among the groups and five weeks for the spinal cultures, there was actually an increase in the number of spinal lesions in the birds that had received the CPSC mutant as their probiotic. So we were still, you know, hope springs eternal in research, and we couldn't let go of that 20% trend. So thought, what could we do to make this assay more sensitive? Perhaps we could find a difference. So to do that, we, want, we chose to optimize our in vivo challenge model to more closely resemble a natural field infection. And we did that in a couple different ways. But the first step was to, to decrease that challenge dose from 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 5. When we first started this model, the goal was just to make sure we could reproduce the disease because people hadn't been able to do that. But now, maybe we could reduce to 10 to the 5 CFU. And we did this in two different ways. First, we challenged all birds, 20 birds per pen. That's our standard challenge model. And then in the second group, we challenged only three of the birds per pen, and we called that our select challenge model. So again, for our study design, we placed 120 chicks per group, a day of hatch, and then day one and three, they received 10 to the seventh CFU of only the CE probiotic, the commensal probiotic, or PBS. Then on day five, we challenged with 10 to the five CFU in either all 20 birds per pen or only three birds per pen. Then at day 14, again, we cultured spleens for sepsis. And at day 35, we cultured spleens and spines. So at two weeks, we were blissfully happy. There was a significant decrease in the number of positive spleen cultures in the birds that had received the commensal probiotic in both the select and standard model. However, at five weeks, that difference was gone. There was no significant difference. And in fact, for the spinal cultures, again, there was an increase in the number of spinal lesions in the birds that had received the commensal probiotic. I want to note that we had an APEC outbreak in these birds, and we were able to isolate APEC from late mortality across the treatment groups. And we have to wonder if that APEC co-infection or the sequelae may have impacted our experimental outcomes very negatively, and so we'd, we'd like to see that repeated. So for their next study, we thought, what if we take an earlier approach? What if the birds can hatch and already be colonized with the probiotic? So we turned to in ovo inoculations. So in this model, we wanted to test the safety and efficacy of our commensals or our capsule deletion mutants as their probiotics to protect against pathogenic Enterococcus secorum. So again, we're going to in ovo vaccinate, hatch, and challenge. So in this study design, we inoculated embryos at a day 18 with 10 to the 2 CFU of either the commensal, the CPSC, CPSO deletions, or PBS. And we moved them to separate um, incubators at that point to prevent any cross-contamination. On day of hatched, we placed 50 chicks per group with 25 chicks per pen. On day two, we challenged with 10 to the 7th CFU of our pathogenic strain. And then at day 14, we cultured spleens from all the birds. And unfortunately, there was no difference in the Enterococcus secorum sepsis prevalence among the treatment groups. And perhaps even more importantly, we, safety concerns were raised with both the deletion mutants, even though we'd shown that they were attenuated in both an embryo lethality and a bird challenge model. 
The CPSC demonstrated a phenotypic reversion to wild type in some cases, and I was actually able to isolate it from several spleens. And the CPSO vaccinated birds had a very high prevalence of retained yolk sacs. So, in conclusion, commensal Enterococcus sequorum strains may be useful as probiotics to competitively exclude the pathogenic strains in that first critical step of gut colonization. Changes to the model, EC model, should be considered to make it more sensitive, and it may lead to discovery of successful interventions to decrease the mortality of pathogenic Enterococcus sequorum infection. And also, caution should be used when testing even attenuated deletion mutants as modified live vaccine as reversion to virulence is possible. And with that, here are our references and our acknowledgments. I again would like to thank the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association for supporting this project, but also for their funding has done an incredible amount to advance the foundation knowledge of pathogenic Enterococcus sequorum. We'd also like to thank our industry partners for their valuable supply of eggs and chicks and our partners at the North Carolina State College of Veterinary Medicine. If you have questions, I'd be happy to take them. Do we have any questions? All right. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. We have just a few minutes and we'll get started with our next session.